Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, 10 Ways Expert Device Engineers Create Quality Repeatable Tube Bonds. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of each presentation. Today we will be sharing videos and you will need to turn your computer speakers volume up to hear the videos. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. And now I'd like to introduce Danny Bogan, Vice President, Sales and Marketing. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first of a series of webinars designed to provide insight on the technology and techniques behind machine solutions equipment. My name is Danny Bogan, Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Machine Solutions. Over the last seven years, Machine Solutions has purposefully brought together some of the most respected brands in catheter manufacturing and testing equipment. Our goal is to be a one-stop shop for premier equipment and services to the catheter manufacturing industry. One of the key strategies that we have is to make sure that we retain the technology experts who invented the technology and can continue to share their product knowledge to support our customers and advance that technology. Today, we have three of those product experts here to provide insight on different types of technology that can be used to create reliable tube bonds, or as we like to simply say, how to best melt and squish plastic. Brian Beam, Scott DeWitt, and Rudy Altifor will present strategies on making lap joints, butt welds, and balloon bonds using different types of energy sources. At the end of each pre presentation, each presenter will answer a few of the questions from the audience. So please uh, put those questions in the question box and we're gonna do our best to answer all of those questions either here at the webinar or with a Q&A after the webinar for you guys. So let's get started. Brian Beam is CTO of Brian uh, Beam Designs, a catheter equipment company that provides the foundation to processing machines used to manufacture catheters. Prior to co-founding Beam Designs, he worked at such pioneering companies as Radiant Medical, Heartpoint, CVIS, and Guiding Corporation. Brian is inventor of over 75 machines and several branded product lines. He has extensive device manufacturing and thermoplastic material selection knowledge. He'll be presented on how to form lap joints using resistive heating dyes and hot air products. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Machine Solutions Tube Bonding Webinar Series. My name is Brian Beam, and in this segment, I'll be reviewing lap joints or overlap joints and everything you need to know to make great joints. Let's first define what is a lap joint. Quite simply, a lap joint is where one material overlaps the other material for a certain length. The materials are then heated and an adherence is created between the materials. This is typical of balloons, but it can also be a shaft to another shaft. What are the topics we'll be discussing? What are the materials you can and can't bond? What are the materials you need to create good bonds? What are the two configurations of lap joints? And what technologies should you consider for your particular overlap application? Let's review the materials. Let's first start by saying the reason you would cho choose a lap joint is because you have dissimilar materials. This is where one material is going to adhere to the other material. That means that at least one of the materials must be a thermoplastic. That means you can have high durometer to low durometer materials, braided to non-braided, similar to dissimilar polymers, and even plastic to metal. The plastic must be, again, a thermoplastic. In the case of identical materials, it's important to note that those materials will create a weld in which they will become one polymer again. In the case of dissimilar materials, one material is going to adhere to the other material. The different configurations, uh, pretty simple. A balloon to a tube in which either one leg or both are adhered to the shaft within. 
of, again, these can be similar polymers or dissimilar polymers. In the case of similar polymers, such as PVC or urethane, if both the balloon and the shaft are the same, you are welding those together. In the case of dissimilar materials, such as PET to PBAX, you're creating an adherence between them. These overlaps can be long length, they can be short length, it all depends on the requirements of that joint. It needs to be strong, it needs to withstand pressure, uh, it all depends on what that uh, configuration needs to perform at when you're done. Process requirements. Let's talk about the materials you need in order to create bonds. Number one are mandrels, typically stainless steel and preferably PTFE or some other lubricious coating on the mandrel. It is really important and almost impossible to create an overlap joint without supporting the ID of the materials. If you're getting that polymer hot enough to flow, you're getting it hot enough to collapse the ID. Therefore, some type of support must be given to the ID of the tubes being bonded to prevent them from closing off. Protective sleeves, typically FEP, often polyester, sometimes polyolefin. The protective sleeve serves a number of functions. It can protect the materials from sticking to the die heads in the case of split die bonding. It can add radial compression. It can also facilitate nice smooth blending of the polymers. When you are designing a lap joint, it's very important to consider uh, what is important in the lap joint. Is it smooth transition? Is it low profile? Is it resistance to torque? Is it resistance to tension force? All of these things must be considered when you're choosing a technology, what type of lap joint you're gonna consider, how long the bond is, whether you want braids to not migrate to the surface. So it's very important to understand the requirements of the finished bond. The process considerations. Which technology you should choose, again, depends on what the requirements of that joint are. If you have thick materials, if you need a, a long overlap for strength, uh, there's a number of different reasons you would choose either split die bonding or hot air. It all depends on your materials, the configuration, and the requirements. Let's take a look at some of those technologies. We'll start by talking about split die bonding. Split die bonding is where two half round heated dies come together and deliver heat to the materials by direct contact. They're not directly contacting the materials within because there's going to be a protective sleeve, as we mentioned before, either FEP or PET or polyolefin, uh, to cover the joint and protect that material from sticking to those die heads. Those die heads are always going to be at temperature. So you can't have the die heads deliver the heat and then separate uh, without the material sticking to the die heads unless you have that protective sleeve in place. The split die bonding would be chosen when you need to deliver very focused heat to a specific region of material. Sometimes you have parts of the catheter assembly that are sensitive to heat, whether it's a balloon or sensors or something else, and you don't want a lot of heat being spread along the shaft as in the case with hot air. Split dies can be machined to a very narrow length and deliver that temperature right where you need it. Split die bonders are typically compact, take up a minimal amount of space, and are very good for JIT situations in which you are performing a bond within an assembly line. Split die bonding offers very simple, very cost-effective tool interchange. Uh, these die heads can be machined very quickly, very easily, and interchanged for multiple processes. When would you consider hot air? 
hot air is typically used when you have very thick walled materials or when it's unimportant that you protect certain parts of the materials from that residual heat. Uh, you can also choose hot air if you have multiple sizes you need to process within a single machine or process. The hot air nozzle can be sized so that a wide range of sizes in your materials can be processed within that single nozzle. Lots of product fixturing options are available for both the hot air and the split die bonding in order to support long lengths. Uh, smooth transitions are also uh, beneficial with hot air because as you spread that heat along the edges of those two materials, uh, the FEP or the protective sleeve is going to shrink down and facilitate that nice smooth blending of the materials uh, as, that, uh, as that heat disperses along the shaft. So these are some of the reasons you would consider hot air. Uh, one thing I would like to touch on is how to prep your materials for an overlap joint. It is really important sometimes that you neck down one of the materials to fit more easily into the other material, or in the case of braided material that cannot be necked, it's important to expand the other material or cuff the material for a certain length to allow it to fit over the braided tube. So. These are all the things that you need to consider when choosing a lap joint and designing that lap joint and choosing a technology. Thanks for attending, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Brian. Hey, My Brian. Pleasure. Thank you very much. So we'll answer a couple questions from the audience. To start with, one of the questions that I frequently get is for either hot dyes or hot air bonding processes, where is the temperature measured and how do you maintain a stable manufacturing environment uh, with regards to that temperature? Sure, that's a great question. And uh, the answer is uh, also uh, very important. Uh, with respect to uh, thermal dye bonding, uh, now this is uh, uh, this is difficult to um, this is difficult to obtain. You prefer to measure the temperature at the surface uh, of the dye that's going to make contact with the materials. However, that's very difficult to do because it's a curved surface. Putting a thermocouple junction onto that surface simply does not give you an accurate reading. You would have to uh, typically machine a custom thermocouple to that specific diameter. So what we recommend is that you use a surface probe and measure the temperature at that uh, half round cutout on the side of the die head. Since the control thermocouple is already at the point of use, which is just behind that, uh, that half round cutout, uh, the, the temperature being measured by the controller uh, tends to be accurate to within about five degrees. Uh, you can expect about plus or minus two degrees or less of stability with the with the die heads, uh, but uh, but to be honest, measuring that temperature can be difficult. So measure it using a surface probe on the outside of the die head. With respect to hot air, most people would prefer to measure the temperature right at the center or the focal point of the air jets uh, of the nozzle. Uh, this is uh, somewhat subjective because once you put materials into that nozzle, you're changing the flow dynamics. So what we prefer is to measure the temperature at 1 16th of an inch outside of any one of the air exit ports because as soon as that air leaves the nozzle, it's gonna to start to cool very rapidly. And the fact is, when you have materials in the nozzle, your materials are much closer to the exit point. And if, this, if the nozzle is sized properly, uh, then measuring it just at the exit point or just outside the exit point, it gives you a better representation of what the surface of your materials are going to see. Those materials are typically so small that they will absorb that heat very quickly and uh, you know the temperature is going to be uniform uh, all the way through. So just outside the exit port, about a sixteenth of an inch, 
for hot air, and then the outside of the die at the bore for hot dye. Thanks, Brian. So a couple questions are coming in are about the size of the material and size of the uh, uh, heating dyes. So can you talk about what bond sizes are, are possible and how you should size uh, the split dyes for each, uh, each application? Certainly. So the great thing about split dyes, you, you can have overlap joints up to, uh, we have done dye bonders up to four centimeters in length. Um, that's kind of an unusual, that's more like a lamination, but that amount of length is possible with the split dyes. The temperature is very uniform end to end. Uh, so that's a, a good choice when you have a, a, an unusually long joint um, or even a, you know, a very narrow one, but uh, anywhere from one millimeter minimum to four centimeters maximum for split die bonding. With respect to sizing, uh, this, this is a great question because I think this is one of the most misunderstood aspects of split die bonding. Uh, what you really want is you want those dies to be in full contact with the outside of the protective sleeve throughout the whole process. This does mean you need to pre-shrink the sleeve onto the materials. You then measure that OD and size the die heads three thousandths of an inch smaller. This way you get a little bit of compression, you're guaranteed to get full contact, and you're going to get the most efficient process possible. There's a lot of customers out there that still do this uh, process with a split die bonder with, uh, without the dies making full contact. Sure, it works, but the process is much, much longer by the factor of three to four times longer because you're not transferring that heat directly into the materials by contact. So pre-shrink your sleeve, measure the OD, size the dies slightly smaller by 3,000. Awesome. awesome. And last question that I have is there's a few questions about uh, what dye materials they can use and what kind of temperatures and materials uh, would be at the upper end of the temperature limit that you could do for a split dye process? Sure, that's a great question. The die heads standard are aluminum, uh, which uh, 6061 aluminum, which you can then have either uh, nickel plated or some other type of protective coating to cover the bare aluminum. Aluminum provides the best thermal transfer compared to other materials. Uh, you can use stainless steel, that's not a problem. The process is gonna be slightly longer because stainless steel does not like to release heat as efficiently as something like aluminum or copper or brass. So anything that is capable of uh, conducting heat from the dye base up to the thermocouple is gonna be acceptable. Uh, I get a, a, one of the most common questions I get is why don't you use beryllium copper because it conducts so well. The, the reason is that the control thermocouple is right at the bore. So it, it doesn't matter what the rate of conductivity is, uh, as long as that die head comes up to full saturation, any material is going to work. So aluminum was chosen because it's quick and easy to machine and cost effective, perfectly acceptable to use stainless steel, but you're only talking about maybe a 10% increase in the process time. Awesome. Thank you very much for your presentation and answering those questions, Brian. Absolutely. Next, next we'll talk to Scott DeWitt. Scott is the value stream leader for machine solutions, tipping and bonding product lines and former general manager of plastic weld systems. He has over 13 years experience and is our resident expert in using radio frequency energy for thermoplastic tube bonding. He's gonna present the ins and outs of butt welding, including consideration for materials, configuration, manufacturability and testing. Welcome to this portion of Machine Solutions webinar on tube bonding. I sincerely hope you'll find this information useful. I'll be discussing a specific type of tube joining we refer to as butt welding. The Machine Solutions design team defines butt welding as joining the square cut ends of two tubes together to form one continuous tube. The process uses a combination of heat, pressure, and tooling to direct and constrain the flow of melted polymer into a defined shape. This presentation covers what I believe are the four main areas to consider as you design a catheter that requires a buck welded tube section. 
Throughout this presentation, I'll focus on outlining the major considerations and then providing a short list of tips to help avoid typical problems. This isn't an exhaustive dive into all the details, but should get you uh, well along the way uh, to creating a good design. The materials of construction is the first consideration. We'll spend a little bit of time reviewing the most common tripping points on material selections that our technical team has encountered during the past 20 years. Then we'll spend some time reviewing some basic configurations that can utilize butt welding as an effective joining technology. Occasionally, designers aren't aware of the constraints that their design choices place on their manufacturing teammates. We'll briefly consider a few points that will help avoid some common difficulties. And finally, we'll discuss some considerations for testing the results. Unambiguous requirements or configurations that can't be uh, properly tested are avoidable troublemakers. Our first area of consideration is the type of materials being joined. Dissimilar materials cannot be heat bonded together. As an example, PVC and polyethylene can't be thermally joined. One key indicator of compatibility is melting point. Polymers with significant differences in melting point will probably not be able to be bonded together. Likewise, similar polymers or the same polymer, but with significant differences in durometer will uh, result in redu reduced joint strength. Additives can be a source of frustration for achieving the desired bonding characteristics you have to consider all the additives that are in your polymer. As an example, uh, our technical teams have seen in multiple instances where colorants affect the polymer, polymer's ability to form a high strength bond or cause other issues that affect final joint quality. Those issues could be uh, blending where two colors are noticeably uh, intermingled uh, or even uh, the tube sticking in the dye. Radio opaque additives and extrusion processing aids can also have a negative impact. Radio opaque additives tend to be very sticky uh, and they also have poor flow characteristics, so you might not be able to fill the dye. My main point here is that you have to know what's compounded into the polymer to set proper performance expectations. And if you can't achieve your expectations with the polymers, you have to be prepared to alter your material selections. I did mention thin walls here on this slide. Just remember that thin walls have a minimal tensile strength regardless of the polymer used. Butt welding can be used to join tubes of various constructions. The simplest is a single lumen extrusion. Single lumen tubes can be constructed of multiple layers of polymer. These can be produced either by co-extrusion or lamination techniques. This is an example of a single lumen tube bonded joint. A layer of metallic or polymeric grating can be included in the lamination to provide kink or torque resistance. Laminations usually have a wider uh, outside diameter tolerance range than simple extrusions and provide less surface area for the materials to thermally bond OD variation is a specific concern we'll talk about in a little bit. Please make sure you understand these points when creating your design and establishing your performance specifications. Multi-lumen tubes are a specialty subset that can encompass single polymer extrusions and multi-layer laminations. The critical point with these is to understand how the position of the lumens impacts the heat flow from your tooling through the entire thickness of the tube. Lumens and their supporting mandrels act as insulators, so achieving a su sufficient bond for all mating surfaces can be a challenge. Multi-lumen tubes also tend to have a very thin wall cross-section. This further complicates achieving good bond strength and really introduces a new potential defect breakthrough of one lumen into adjacent lumens. Tapered ID transitions used to bond two different sized tubes together pose a different type of challenge. This is an example of a tapered ID bond. Most designers simply draw the transition assuming the wall thickness will remain constant. This assumption may cause trouble for your assembly department since it requires close control of the mandrel's position. 
mandrel positional accuracy and repeat repeatability can be difficult to achieve. In some cases, you can combine butt welding and pit forming into a single step. This would be an example of that. Tip forming is this end, and butt welding is the interface between the two different colors. Due to the many variables and challenges this poses, I'd recommend discussing the feasibility with experts and it falls pretty much outside the, the scope of what we want to talk about today. The graphic in this slide is a format my company uses to communicate important features that will be imparted to the welded area of the tubes. We often visually exaggerate some features to ensure our customers understand the implications of their design decisions. For conventional end-to-end -end welds, the critical dimensional characteristics to consider are each tube's OD, mentioned here, the ID, listed here, concentricity and associated tolerances, uh, and also the length of the weld, and then the position of the interface within the weld. Having a consistent smooth OD is usually a primary customer requirement for finished welded joints. Therefore, the two tubes must have similar OD specifications. So you can see we've noted the OD, OD and ID specifications for each tube here. The bonding tooling must be sized to handle the entire range of the tube's tolerances. Therefore, the OD of the bonded joint will always be at the maximum side of the extrusion tolerance. The transition from the heated area in the tool to the non-heated area outside the tooling will be most noticeable when extrusion ODs are on the low end of specification. Similarly, the ID will always be at the low end of specification through the welded area because the mandrel has to fit in the smallest lumen. Transitions will be most prominent on the tubes with the largest ID, and you can see that visually exaggerated in this area. One important point, do not assume that your tubes will remain perfectly concentric within the die, especially for smaller tubes with um, smaller mandrel sizes. Melted plastic flows, which means the mandrels and tubes can be pushed to one side of the die's diameter. This is especially true for tubes that are on the low end of OD tolerance or the high end of ID tolerance. The finished part will have a smooth OD transition in one area and a noticeable transition step on the opposite side. All the tolerance could be reflected in that transition step. And as an example, a tolerance, an OD tolerance of plus or minus three thousandths could show up as no step in the transition area here, but a six thousandths high step on this side. Marketing teams generally love a perfectly straight circumferential line that visually identifies where the two tubes have been joined. In our experience, this tends to indicate insufficient mechanical mixing of the two tube ends, and therefore the joint has a lower strength. The four highlights in this slide are a short summary of what to consider for a simple single lumen butt weld design we reviewed in the previous slides. The additional complexities of laminations, braid layers, and multi-lumen tubes would have similar highlights, but with additional details. One specific point about braided tubes is critical to understand. The braid moves when the polymer around it is heated. Residual stress from the braiding process causes the cut end of the, of the braid to spring open. During the bonding process, not only are you softening the braid in the area where the weld is, but you're also pushing the ends of the tubes together. The two forces act to push the braid outward and pop through to the OD surface. This is generally considered a serious defect by most customers. We found that tooling that minimizes the width of the heating zone will help avoid this problem. Also, annealing the braid will help reduce the breakthrough and reduce the residual stress. High quality end cuts produced from cutting processes that minimize the displacement and deformation of the cut wire ends will further improve the results. Butt welding different size tubes together is a specialty consideration. 
all the previous slides points should be considered here as well. The main difference is to consider what the ID transition configuration from the large tube to the small tube needs to be. So we're talking about this area right in here. If you must have a smooth paper transition, consider how you're going to assure consistent placement of the mandrel that forms it. Remember, this position will determine the thickness of the wall section in the bonded area, and therefore it will have a direct impact on the joint's tensile strength, as well as other mechanical attributes in that area. Also, since I mentioned large versus small tube size, it seems appropriate to mention the impact mandrels have on heat absorption in the welding area. Try to avoid using large solid metallic mandrels wherever possible. This is an experience-based decision point that depends a lot on the polymer, the joint configuration, the heating technology that you're using, and the final product requirements. In general, if you're using the appropriate polymers, but you can achieve a good quality bond, where the results are consistent from one cycle to the next, you might want to evaluate whether or not your mandrel is acting as a heat sink. The design highlights in this slide are very similar to the simple butt welding highlights with the exception of adding the qualifications about the ID transition. Due to the unique problems of bonding braided laminated tubes, you'll have to give special attention to the location of the bonded joint. Placing the joint anywhere on the paper will likely cause the braid to break through to the OD surface. So there'll be some special design considerations um, for that subsection. I like to say that variation is the enemy of consistency and repeatability in a manufacturing outcome. Manufacturability is not limited to your finished part design. You have to consider the quality of the components and the preceding manufacturing processes as well. Here's a few tips that we've compiled throughout the past several years. Always strive to supply your bonding process with high quality inputs. Drive your identification of inputs down to a sufficient level to ensure that variations are minimized as much as possible. Inputs could include raw materials, process components, processing equipment, environmental controls, and human influence. Specify extrusion tolerances as tightly as practical. Use good tooling design practices to stabilize the presentation of your materials into the various processes. High quality manufacturing equipment and processes with good control points are essential throughout the product uh, production steps. As an example, a poorly cut tube end can destroy your process capability in spite of all other factors being properly controlled and designed. Processing aids like lubricants can make a world of difference, either positive or negative. Consider this point carefully and find suppliers who have flexibility to adapt to your specific needs. Also, consider whether or not you want a turnkey solution. Some equipment manufacturers will be reluctant to support your process development efforts when their machine is matched with tooling or fixturing designed or fabricated by another company. And finally, after all the work is completed, how do we assess whether or not the results are acceptable? This topic is very broad and very well could be its own webinar. From a bonded joint perspective, I'll focus only on the mechanical tests that would typically be sustained in the manufacturing environment. The most common areas of concern we've observed relate to how the test specimen is held in the testing machine. Assemblies with short bonded segments pose a particular challenge since the proximity of the grippers and texture of the gripping pads can have a direct impact on the results. My main point about this is to consider how you actually do the test and either devise a gripping method that overcomes the potential impact of the grippers or design your process in a way that enables producing test specimens of sufficient length to move the grippers away from the test area. If you can't do this, you might consider alternative test methods like hydraulic burst testing. Some designers specify flex tests as a way to test joint integrity. I recommend you find ways to eliminate subjectivity. Any test where the tubes are held by a human and then bent to a certain extent should be examined for repeatability and subjectivity. This concludes the presentation on butt welding design considerations. I look forward to addressing your questions or comments. Thank you for your participation and attention.
Thank you, Scott. Thank you. So there's a couple questions that we have. Um, the first one was to talk about the effects and impacts of lubricants on the butt welding process and maybe some strategies uh, pro for using lubricants or alternatives to using lubricants. Sure, that's a, a common and a, and a great question. Um, lubricants can act to um, decrease your tensile value. Um, lubricants goal is, the job is to move the plastic into the, um, in the mold and to prevent it from sticking. So uh, not only did it prevent it sticking to the mold, but it also stops the ends from sticking together sometimes. So, um, you know, you've got to consider that. Uh, there's, there's ways around that. Uh, you can consider putting some type of a coating on the mold. Uh, so there's a variety of nonstick coatings. Uh, or you can also line the, um, the mold with a, a PTFE sleeve. Um, there are certain techniques that go with that. Uh, so we're pretty conversant in all of them. Thank you. Um, on a similar subject, people have been asking about how to achieve a butt weld without braid exposure and what you do to control the braid end uh, to make sure that it doesn't become exposed during the butt weld process. Another big problem and a great question. I addressed it a little bit in the, in the presentation, but um, you know, braiding, uh, we call it braid pop, uh, is, is a real problem. Uh, so our strategies are always to, um, first of all, start off with um, as good an end cut as possible. Uh, it's a challenge that gets thrown back on our customers, mostly. Um, if you have a, a typical shear cut, so you know, you've got your blade coming down and it just cuts off the tube, it's gonna take and pull the wires down and, and you know, the, the downstroke of the cut is gonna have wires that break through the surface to start with. And there's nothing the process can do, there's nothing the body process can do to reflow or reshape those wires. So if you don't start with a good cut in the first place, you're in trouble. Um, a narrow heat band uh, will help minimize how much of the braid can pop out of its constraint. So uh, our, our technology can focus down to uh, two millimeters wide and we can place it very precisely. So that helps a lot. Uh, and also helps to anneal the braid. So we can talk to our folks at Steger and they've got a solution for annealing sections of, of braid. So if you combine all those three things, uh, you can have a, a high yield successful outcome. Thanks, Scott. Next question is to talk about a uh, sharply defined bond line. I know you addressed this in your presentation, but just wanted to follow up on it. Uh, like you said, a lot of marketing departments believe this is a highly desirable characteristic, but of course it's going to impact your um, um, pull strength. So can you talk about uh, the pluses and minuses and strategies to creating a fine line versus a blended line? Sure, hopefully there's no marketing people on the call. Um, so if you think about the fact that tubes have tolerances and you're dealing with two different sets of extrusions, you've got one color or one size tube and then another one's being bonded together. When you bring those two together, they're always gonna have some type of a different tolerance. And remember that the cavity is sized to fit the maximum OD. So you're always gonna have a situation where one tube is a little bit smaller than another. And when you go to put those together and they start to melt, uh, certainly the, the larger tube is going to start to melt and flow before the smaller one. So it will tend to flow over the smaller tube. Um, also, tubes aren't perfectly round. Uh, no matter what we like to think, they aren't. Uh, so there'll be little channels on the OD where the smaller tube uh, will allow flow of the larger tube. So, you know, visually, it's really difficult just to get that perfect bond line unless you have super tightly controlled uh, extrusion tolerances. The second point is if, um, if you're not pushing the tubes together well enough, you know, no, no tube end cut is perfectly square. So there's always some kind of a gap that has to be filled. So if you aren't pushing hard enough to fill that gap, then you're not gonna get a good bond strength. When you push hard enough to fill that gap, then you start pushing one polymer over another. So it's, I won't say it's impossible, but it's really difficult, difficult to get high strength bonds with a, a perfectly sharp uh, joining line. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Scott. We'll move to our next presenter. Rudy Altifer is the sales director for BW Tech. His expertise comes from working closely with global customers for the last three years. And Rudy has built up an extensive knowledge around laser bonding applications, equipment requirements, and the overall market for laser welding. His strengths center around, center around recommending the right machine for the right application. Let's hear from Rudy on why laser is the ideal energy source for balloon bonding applications.
A warm welcome from Switzerland and thank you for attending Machine Solutions webinar. What is laser bonding? What are the main advantages of it? And what are some practical hints and tips for a good laser bond? Laser bonding introduction. Laser welding is a type of thermal bonding which differs from traditional thermal bonding. The heating of the material is done by the laser light instead of, for example, hot dyes or hot air. The welding is very efficient for the size of the weld is well defined by the laser spot. The energy transfer takes place without any contacting material and the energy take up can be controlled precisely with a very good repeatability. Due to highly focused laser light, it is easy to focus the light to a very small spot size of less than 0.5 mil. This results in very small bonds. The wavelength of a CO2 laser is close to the resonance frequencies of polymer groups. Because of this, CO2 laser light can be absorbed by clear polymer materials. This makes it possible for the polymer material to be heated throughout the path of the laser light. This is especially useful for catheter laser bonding in that it not only creates a bond between two polymer materials, but also smooths out the tubing edge at the joint. The way how the laser heats and melts the polymer materials makes it more consistent in creating tight bonds. This is good news, of course, to process engineers and QA personnel to whom consistency is very important. What are the main advantages of laser bonding? Some of the main advantages are, we have control heat emission at the specific location with a defined amount of energy without jeopardizing the balloon with the heat emission. Through the small spot size, we achieve a very precise, accurate, repeatable weld. We have an extreme short process time. Adjustable focus position during the welding process allows to do various soft tips and tapered welds. We have a high flexibility through point weld, length weld, and adjustable focus position and different param parameters that we can set. We have quality assurance, accurate product placement through camera images, process parameters are stored for every process cycle, including the video of the process itself. What are the main applications for laser bonding? We have different, different types of welding. The main application is the welding of the balloon to the catheter. We can weld the proximal side of it, the distal side, and also do the soft tip. We can do single lumen, multiple lumens. The machine gives you the capability of doing distal weld and tip forming in the same process, as well as doing tapered welds. What is important for a good weld in terms of quality? We need to understand that we need what we need to accomplish. What are the requirements regarding the joint strength, the flexibility, visual characteristics? What will you need to test and how will you test it? Configuration. What are some of the key parameters that we must consider getting a good quality bond? Tube material. Tube polymers must be compatible for heat bonding. Similar melting points are easy to weld, dissimilar or challenging, even for the same base polymer. Tube overlap. Laser bonding needs an overlap of the tubing of preferably 0.5 mil. Heat shrink tubing. The welding force is typically applied to the product using a heat shrink tube. Many different products are available from different suppliers. Different base materials are used such as polyolefin, polyester, or fluor polymers. The product differs in terms of dimensions, 
absorption behavior, shrinking temperature, shrinking ratio, shrinking force, transparency, and peelability. The selection of a shrinking tube can be a key in the process development. Pre-cut shrinking tubes allow an easier peeling after the process. A fitting shrinking tube is essential to get a good quality bond. Energy take up and laser power. A good bond is an interplay between laser power, laser duration, laser travel speed, spot size and rotation speed. Whereas the first three parameters define the overall energy take up, the spot size defines the local energy density and the rotation speed assures a uniform heat distribution. To increase the energy take up, increase the laser power or increase the laser duration or decrease the laser travel speed. Typically, a good strategy is to start with a low energy take up and work your way up. Rotation. A medium rotation speed allows a uniform heat distribution over the whole surface. A consistent rotation is achieved by a tightly assembled product and a fitting straight mandrel. If your product cannot be rotated, consider the sophisticated laser welding technology of the BW Tech Laser Welding Machine 1530. Spot size and focus point. The spot size of the laser beam can be adjusted. This allows the use of different welding widths and energy densities. The bigger the spot, the smaller the energy density. Point weld and length weld. There is great freedom to choose and combine different welding strategies. Start with a point weld to fix the product. Use length weld to bond the product and finish with a point weld for a smooth joint. Some known challenges. Process parameter. The interaction of various process parameters does not play together. Laser spot, spot size, rotation speed, or the speed of the length weld. Somehow, it doesn't work. Tolerances. The different components have too much distance between each other, between the lumen tube, the balloon, and the heat shrink. Or we have alignment problems. The mandrel is not straight which leads to misalignment of the laser, which causes a not uniform laser bond. Thank you so much for your attention for this introduction into laser welding. It's my privilege that I can show you now a video of a laser application right now. Thank you so much. The BW Tech 1410 laser welding machine is used to connect fine plastic tubing, ideal for welding of the distal and proximal side of PTCA and PTA balloon catheters. All movement axes are highly accurate, and the machine is optimized for quick and easy maintenance. Loading the product is very user friendly, and the on screen positioning markers support fast and accurate positioning. The BW Tech HMI allows individual recipe steps to adapt the welding process to the specific product. Length weld, point weld, tip forming, and tapered weld are possible. Process parameters include laser power, different focus positions, rotation speed, distance, and travel speed. The focus of the laser beam can be adjusted as a process parameter during welding. This capability opens new possibilities for tapered welds and tip forming. With the software option work order management, the machine is capable of adapting and displaying the specific and unique workflow of your company. The 1410 laser welder is CE certified and complies with the safety regulations for a laser welder. The machine is network compatible and allows for an easy data management.
Thank you, Rudy. So we have Rudy and we want to welcome Sam Troxler, who's our application specialist at BW Tech in Switzerland. So guys, one of the first questions we, we frequently get is why does the bond site need a shrinking tube and can you do a bond without a shrinking tube? Yes, so there's uh, the quick answer is no, there is not uh, no possibility to do a bond without a shrinking tube. The problem is that you need something to compress the whole, uh, the two materials together. So if you would have no um, shrinking tube, it, it would just fall apart or the, the outer material outer material would burn off before you get uh, the inner material hot. Okay, and as a follow-up question, some people are asking, um, what type of laser, or excuse me, what type of shrink materials are best used with the laser? I know um, Rudy addressed that slightly, but can you talk about maybe some of the ones you use in your lab there? Um, so what we use often in our lab is a, a material called RNF100, um, which is ju just a very, um, I would say forgivable material. Um, it, it has a, a good a compression force and it's, it's just very easy to work with. Um, it has one slight downside. It is not as clear as others. There are um, a lot of other companies making different tubes and you can basically select them in, in regard of what, uh, um, what um, how do you say this, uh, like what requirements you have. So there are some which have like this easy peel function, which are very easy to peel. Others are more clear there, but there is just a, a very big variety. Okay. So we talked a lot about spot size. Can you tell us how spot size is adjusted and how you would calibrate that spot size? So what we do with spot size is we actually move the whole, the, the beam expander up and down, which then basically moves the, the, the focal point away from the product. So we set, uh, we calibrate the, uh, the focal point by, um, uh, with a, a process where we basically search for the smallest possible focal point and we set this point to where the axis of the product is and then if you change the focal distance that means you move away from the from the focal point with your product axis so that the beam gets bigger okay um if the assembly is falling apart or losing its position when the rotation starts what can we do um, I would say the, the ultimate thing you could you could do is um, is pre-shrink the the whole assembly, um, but that's really, as I said, the ultimate uh, solution to the problem. Um, otherwise, you could uh, start with a slightly so, slower speed and try to like pre-shrink it on the machine slightly, um, or sometimes it, it it even would make sense to, for example, change the shrinking tube to maybe one which has a tighter fit and holds together the whole assembly a bit tighter um, in the beginning of the process. Is there a, okay, thank you. Um, one of the questions that we have is, how do you manage eccentric weldings? Um, it's just, I would say it, it's a bit more process development than with others, but it's easy, quite easily possible. Since it's rotating, it, it's not that big of a deal if it's not too much eccentric that it would, would not be able to rotate um, uh, fast enough, but normally it, it's not that big of a, of a deal. You just have to approach it a bit, uh, uh, or a bit with a bit less energy than others to give it a bit more time. But otherwise, it's not not a big of a deal. Okay, Rudy. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned a uh, model fifteen thirty for applications where you can't rotate the part. Can you talk about that equipment and how it operates? Absolutely. Thank you, Danny. So. Uh, we recommend uh, for most processes the 1410 laser because it's uh, more forgiving, it's easier uh, for alignment and also for, for calibration. But the 1530, uh, the product doesn't have to rotate, but the laser beam is rotating around the product, which of course gives you new opportunity if you have a device that you can't rotate and simply can't uh, have a good bond with, uh, with the 1410 laser. For such application, the 15 30 is, is the right, is the right uh, laser, the right uh, equipment, and gives you new possibilities and opportunities uh, for making a good bond uh, for a difficult uh, product. All right, thank you very much, Rudy and Sam. And thank you for all our presenters who presented today. 
we're going to wrap up our webinar today. Uh, everyone that attended is going to receive a follow-up email with a link to review the recording. And we're also going to be sending out a survey to everyone attending, <clears throat> looking for suggestions for follow-up topics for our next event. I believe our next event, we're looking at talking about braided catheters, such as the different braid patterns you have and how to maintain your braiders. Uh, but we're looking for all sorts of ideas for different topics that we can cover as we try to make this a, a frequent event to try to uh, support our customers and increase our customers' knowledge base on how to best use our equipment. So thank you everybody for attending and uh, please send those suggestions for future events or suggestions for improvements to our platform. We really appreciate it.